why don't we, why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, we bless your holy name. Lord God, I thank you for the call that you've put on these young men's life to discern their vocation. And I thank you for the way that you've been working since before time to prepare them for their vocation. You created them out of nothing, out of your abundance of your love, to be one with you, to live in your love. Lord, the particular call to serve you as a priest is a call to come and die. I ask, Lord, that as they continue to discern that you would be there with your Holy Spirit every step of the way to confirm with your peace, your joy, your love, what the next step is, how they can continue to progress, not only in their discernment, but in their pursuit of holiness and love. Just be with them, O oh Lord. Bless their families, bless their studies, bless their service. And we ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So I have a prepared talk, but I wanted to just maybe stop before I jump into anything and just say, like, you guys have been absorbing a lot, right? Um, you have any questions, thoughts, responses? Because I mean, it's like it's hard to, it's like, you know, you're like making sausage and you got like a two pound sausage skin and we're trying to like stuff 20 pounds worth of stuff into it. You know, you're like, okay, I'm not, I just, you know, I mean, I don't want anybody to be, feel too overwhelmed. Any, uh, any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Question. Sure. So I keep hearing a lot of uh, a lot of the same names come up with the charismatic movement. Are these individuals still involved, or have they ceased? Or? Uh, most of the people that were at uh, the Duquesne weekend, who are part of the original experience, are still alive. Actually, a few have passed, but there's a lot of people that uh, God is still using them. They're still active. It's the thing about the Holy Spirit. It's like Miracle Grow and uh, I don't know Fountain of Youth all wrapped into one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if I'm, I'm giving you an out before you have to listen to me, so you can keep asking questions. Uh, I think one thing that's always encouraged for us with uh, understanding the call to priest and hearing the voice of, of Christ, you know, mm-hmm. continue. So, and I'm hearing a lot of like, you know, for conversion or just the way that Holy Spirit works is like, it seems like it's it, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Is the Holy Spirit the one that's sort of leading us to that voice of Christ, or how would, how would, how would the relationship of the Holy Spirit fit in with understanding the voice of Christ? That's, that's a great question, because we know that, uh, you know, Jesus has said the Holy Spirit will be an advocate like he's an advocate for us. That means they're both by our sides to lead and guide. The catechism repeatedly refers to the commission of the, the, the Son and the Spirit in bringing about conversion and, and, and revealing the will of the Father and conforming us to that will. So I think, you know, it, they probably tag team it a lot, right? Like Jesus is like, okay, I'm tagging you in spirit. Go move his heart you know, with, a, with an ardent desire for, for my soul. And, you know, uh, you go to this, the soul of Jesus, and you're like, Jesus, I'm here with you. And he's like, let me send you the Holy Spirit because he's going to be your strength. And it just, it, it's like the circular motion of grace. So it's hard to discern, you know, like for me at least, when, is it, when it's the Son of the Spirit because they are so one that it's hard to embrace the Spirit without embracing the Son. Matter of fact, the Spirit wouldn't want you to embrace Him without embracing Christ. The Spirit always wants to reveal Jesus. He always wants to be about speaking in the name of Jesus. That's why, you know, St. Paul says, you can't even say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. He puts that on your lips as the first response to His presence in your life. It's the Lordship of Christ. And so while, um, you know, and I think it's also one of the great challenges of the renewal is to almost, and I don't want to say this as a criticism because I know people who love the Holy Spirit deeply also love the church, but the primacy of Christ, you know, we are, you know, we are Christocentric. And so uh, we don't ever want to take our eyes off that. And the Spirit wouldn't want us to. And so we don't want to overemphasize just the Spirit in our lives because the Spirit ultimately would want to draw us into the Lordship of Christ and the full submission of our hearts and minds and souls to His perfect will for our lives. So, um, yeah, I think it's a circular thing where they cooperate and collaborate with our, and, and work on us. We're, we're so broken that the two of them need to work over time with the Father's uh, guidance, right? You know, like, I don't think we're ever without the, 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 the Trinitarian presence. And that's the beauty of being Catholic, right? You know, like this full expression of God and embracing God as a community of love that we've been invited to step into. I love that. So I hope that helps. 
All right, so what I want to talk about is something that, uh, you know, I kind of ended my uh, session this morning kind of dangling this a little bit, and this is uh, the need for us to have a strong interior life of prayer. Um, as much as I love uh, spontaneous prayer, praise and worship, as long as uh, the, the, the way that the Spirit can release this freedom, this grace to praise and put your hands in the air and all these external exuberant expressions, for me, what I have found after walking with the Spirit since I was 18 years old, which is almost 40 years ago now, is that ultimately what the Spirit wants to draw us to is, is the silence of our own heart. That in that silence of the interior cave, as uh, so many like St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross refer to, the interior castle, the inner cave of the heart, where God wants to commune with us. And I think this is the great challenge, especially uh, the, due to the fact that so many of us, and I would put myself in this, had, were, were rather malformed by the world we grew up in with the noise and the distraction and finding quiet within ourselves. It's almost uncomfortable at times, right, to just sit and be with the Lord and not be distracted and, and drift. But I think it, it is definitely uh, God's desire that each one of us are able to develop and live in this interior life of prayer. So what I want to share about, you know, uh, is just some of, some of the ideas of what God has done, uh, you know, for me. You know, I, I, if you, were you guys at the Life in the Spirit seminars, anyone? I, you know, I share about the Holy Spirit being this undiscovered treasure, you know, the ocean and diving in. But I, I think I would qualify that and just say the interior life of prayer is just as vital. And it is so undiscovered by most Catholics. Most Catholics, most people don't even know how to be quiet. It's constant noise. Like the, and I, I think part of it is when we are quiet, we start to hear our own still small voice within us crying out in pain. We become more aware of our own poverty. And that's scary to embrace because no one wants to, to, to have to confront a problem unless they're, they're sure there's a solution. You know, there's an answer. Like this ache of our heart. Like we're created for more can be a, a scary concept because then it, it, it almost demands that I respond by looking for what that more is. And if I, you know, if I'm, if I'm satisfied with something in the world, then that's good enough. And that's where most people are. I have a life that's good enough. You know, an old friend of mine, you know, you know we used to talk and, you know, he once shared, uh, there's a reason why a, the dogs drink out of toilets. It's because no one puts out fresh water for them. And right now, we have a lot of people drinking from the toilet of the world because no one's offered them the living water of Christ. And they don't know how fulfilling it can be to live in communion with the beautiful heart of Jesus through prayer. I want to start with St. Paul's words from Ephesians chapter 3. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, from every family in heaven on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man. So right away, St. Paul is saying, like, there's something inward. It's not, you know, and, and Paul was like, you know, very clear. And, you know, go and read, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he starts talking about the uh, extraordinary, more external gifts of the Holy Spirit. That, that he says, be desirous of these gifts. But he always takes it back to, but make love your aim. Because ultimately, Inwardly is the transformation that God wants us to experience. You know, it doesn't matter if we're spiritually activating gifts if our hearts are far from God. And, and, and you're like, you can say, well, is that even possible? Well, I think it is because if you listen to Jesus' teaching at the end of Matthew, you know, he says, but, but Jesus, we cast out demons in your name and we perform miracles in your name. And he says, get away from me. I don't know you. Like, you know, and when Mary and Martha are before the Jesus. Jesus is like, Martha's chosen, I mean, Mary's chosen the better portion, Martha, to sit at my feet and just commune with me. So we can be active in ministry, but the actions that we uh, have, that we perform, especially in the priestly life, can almost become an idol if you don't have the interior prayer in place. You know, it is, fool as St. Teresa of Avila said, it's foolishness to try to serve Christ without him, <laughs> you know? Only an idiot would do that. You know, she was very blunt. You know, she just never missed words. She just told you straight up. You try to serve Jesus without Jesus, you're a fool. But St. Paul in this, he says, like, he wants us to be strengthened through his spirit in the inward man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, not through emotion, not through a, um, an effective kind of, you know, sensory 
encounter, but through faith. Well, I, it, but it feels so good to feel the presence of Christ when we pray, right? To know that he's with us, to feel the, you know, his loving hand upon our shoulders, whatever. It's like, yes, but we need to learn to let God dwell in our hearts through faith because there will be times when the Lord will be testing us, when he'll withdraw the, any kind of consolation and let us walk in desolation to test us, to try us to purify our faith. Because if we're only putting our faith in Jesus and seeking him because we, we get this reward, this cookie of, of comfort, then we'll be more about looking for comfort than we are for the will of God. Because the will of God in our lives is often very uncomfortable. So St. Paul says, like, you need to seek him from a place of faith. He's worth it. He's worth it. If he calls you to lay down your life as a martyr tomorrow, and you don't get to live the rest of your life on earth, you have fulfilled your mission, and it's worth it. You know, laying down our lives. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it would be a lot easier to be that kind of martyr, Right? You die quick, you're dead, and you go to heaven, right? And you're celebrated, right? And pretty soon you're being canonized, and it's all good. Most of us have to go through a lifelong work of martyrdom where day by day we're chipped away, putting the old man to death, that the new life in Christ might come through. This bloodless martyrdom, that is the life of, of Christ within us. But why does he want us to approach in the, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith? He goes, so that... that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which, which passes knowledge, that you would be filled unto the fullness of God. That there's a prayer of faith, of going before the Lord in faith, in our inner self, with the help of the Spirit, that then unlocks and enables us to be filled with the fullness of Christ. You know, you, you can consider yourself... Uh, in your vocation as a lantern, right? You're the lantern. Christ is the flame. You want to be the light of the world? Christ has got to be alive in you. You want Christ to be alive in you? You have to have an interior life of prayer. All of the graces of your ordination will not make you that because you're a child of God. And while you have these special graces that allow you to forgive sins and you know, that will give you the ability to say prayers and change bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus you're still called to this intimate relationship with Christ in profound transformation. You know, and, and, and that's the great call of, of, of life. And, and prayer is that what gives us that ability. So I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned that prayer is so that we can have the faith and the, and the, the motivation to, to invest what we need to in, uh, in our prayer. Prayer, uh, first, is a loving conversation between the Father and the Son that we're invited to join. Prayer, you know, any time the, 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 the Trinity is talking within itself, you know, it, it's, it's, it's heavenly communication. And when we talk to God in prayer, that's heavenly communication. That's not us talking to the ceiling. You know, people talk about the Internet. You know, I can get online and I can FaceTime somebody in Australia have instantaneous communication with somebody across the globe. We forget that from the beginning of our creation, we've had the internet. We bow our heads, make the sign of the cross, and we're talking to heaven. We're talking to the Trinity, the life of God. We're activating grace. That sacrament, that smallest sacrament of the sign of the cross is like a key or a button that you push that starts the, 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 the grace flowing. And it's not magic. You gotta, you, your heart has to be joined to these, these symbols and these gestures, but... It is given to us as a tangible way of, of, of entering in and, and assuming this posture of receptivity and communicating with God. We know we're entering into a holy moment. You know, I mean, God bless all the Major League Baseball players, but giving yourself the sign of the cross when you step up to plate, they're not thinking about heaven. They're not trying to do, they're not in that moment moving every part of their being into the presence of God. They're not using it as a sacramental so that they can encounter more grace in that moment. They're asking God, if I give you this, will you give me a home run? I mean, like, it's a total misuse. Now, we might say, oh, he's a, he's a believer. Yeah, you know, but, you know, we have a tendency to think, okay, I'm going into a meeting. Boom, boom, boom. I just gave myself the lucky sign. And I'm, I'm, now God's going to be on my side. It's like, no. It, 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 is, it is the beginning of our movement of our continual going and living out of our baptismal call and entering into that. And, the, and prayer is that eternal dialogue between the Father and the Son is what we're invited into. We know this because in Luke chapter 11, 
right? When, when the, the disciples are seeing Jesus, they saw this pattern. Jesus goes all night and prays. He comes down and he feeds 5,000 people. Jesus goes out and prays all night. He comes down and he chooses his, his apostles. Like Jesus does something big, it's usually preceded by several hours of alone time with God. So they're like, whatever Jesus is doing in prayer, it's working. I want what he has. Jesus, teach us to pray. And the next two words out of the, Lord, the, the mouth of our Savior, our Father, right? It just sets it right there. You don't have to pray to my Father because he's now our Father. My work is to bring you back into the family. What was lost in sin through the old Adam, through the new Adam, I will be redeemed. What Eve's disobedience brought about, the chaos and our, our, our division from the Father and the loss of, of being able to live in his likeness is going to be restored through the yes of the new Eve, the Blessed Mother. She, through her yes, salvation will come into the world. Through Eve's, the first Eve's no, chaos, division, and sin, and death. Through Mary's yes, life. And because of the work that I'm going to complete amongst you, and what I'm doing here amongst you, you're now going to be able to say, Our Father. So start getting used to saying those words. It's happening. Our Father. And, you know, he, Jesus lets us share in his divine sonship through adoption, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through baptism. It says in First John, uh, John chapter 1, verses uh, uh, 12 and 13, right? But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, but of God. It's God's gratuitous grace, his initiative to re reattach us to his family, to make us one with him. So when we say our prayers, when we do, when we go to prayer, it's not a thing that we do. It's not an obligation to fulfill. It's a relationship. It's a mystery that we are invited to participate in, to be a part of with God. And what does that mean? That means that we need to do a good deal of listening. In this conversation, there's one person who says everything that is good and holy and beautiful and wants to speak it into your heart personally. He wants to communicate divine life and love and light to your soul, which means we need to be putting ourselves in a posture of listening when we pray. For true intimacy, we need to not just listen with our ears, but to listen with our heart. We must allow our heart to be permeated by God's divine word. It is the primary way by which God communicates us. This is why the liturgy of the hours is so vital. It is continual immersion into the voice of God, speaking his truth into our hearts. But then there's always spiritual reading to be done. Always, uh, you know, people say to me, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have time to pray. I'm like, if you're so busy, you need to pray. I think it was St. Francis de Sales who said to his, his, his followers, like, you need to pray at least half an hour a day of mental prayer. Unless you're really busy, then you need an hour. <laughs> you know? it, it, but we're the exact opposite. We, we, we prioritize our life in such a way that the first thing to go sometimes is the thing that we need the most. It was after my son's accident that I just finally stopped playing around with God. I was so convinced of the power of prayer. And I had, I had a, I would say I had a pretty good prayer life, but it, but it needed to change. And so I made this commitment that every morning my alarm's going to go off at 4.30 and I'm going to pray. And I'm now up to about an hour and 15 minutes of, of mental prayer every morning, just being with God. Uh, some days it's an hour, some days it's an hour and a half. And I can tell you, over the course of three years, you know, the, 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 the literally over a thousand hours of prayer that I've spent. And I say this in all humility because even the desire to pray is a, is a gift of grace. Because it's not about me. It's about God convincing me and convicting me to make this choice. I have nothing. You know, my face sometimes feels like a mustard seed. But I knew that God was calling me. And it was, so it was more like radical obedience just to this, this undeniable call of Christ to enter into deeper prayer. And now... I can't wake up without thinking my first thought is time to pray. I need to go spend time with the Father. What does it look like for me? Well, I just, I just tell God. I use the, the, the kind of Ignatian prayer, which, I'll, you know, if you're not familiar with, I'm going to kind of review it for you just briefly at the end. But I also just walk, I, sometimes I walk while I pray, and I just walk in silence and say, speak, Lord. You know, and then there's, and even if I get that time in, I'm still looking for, at least 15 minutes throughout the day when I can go into one of the chapels on our campus and just be before the Blessed Sacrament in silence, just to listen. I usually come with no agenda. I say everything that I need to say during my mental prayer and then just give other times during the day where I can just listen to God. So prayer is primary listening. And we do this through 
two things that we that I think are hopefully part of your training in seminary and as you get formed, and that's meditating and contemplating. Yeah, I don't know if, if you've been trained in practice, to how, to, how do I meditate? What's Christian meditation? What is Christian contemplation? And, and seriously, we could spend a whole retreat talking about those two things and just start to scratch the surface. But just as a brief overview, because I want to encourage you to learn to meditate, to learn, learn to, 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 to contemplate. Meditation is an exercise. It's a form of prayer where we seek to understand God's revelation of the truths of faith and the purpose of our Christian life. So we already have a whole body of, of wisdom handed to us by the church, you know, th- including in the primacy of sacred scripture. We have all the teachings of the church. We have the catechism. And then we have a whole volumes of holy writing from the saints, holy men and women who walked before us. You know, I always say, like, if you're a saint today, you're standing on the shoulders of giants who showed us the way. Can you imagine being the first saint and trying to, you'd have to totally, like, oh, it's so good I can read from this saint and and see how to do it, where they were just relying on the Spirit to teach them how to do it. There was no one showing them. No one had gone before them in faith. They were blazing trails, and they've left clear markers on these trails for us to ascend the mountain of God. Thank goodness that we're not having to whack our way through the weeds every time we want. There's paths already created for us. But meditation is when we seek to understand these things. And it's, it's not a seeking. Like there's, a, there's a real trap in meditation because knowledge is such a beautiful thing that knowledge in and of itself can become an idol for us. I want to know all there is to know. Right? I just want to consume. We become consumers of Catholic truth rather than converts who are being converted by Catholic truth. Meditation keeps us from just becoming consumers of, of theology and knowledgeable. You know, St. Paul said, look, knowledge puffs up, you know. It can really be a, a, a source of pride in our lives. But when we approach Scripture with the humility of saying, I'm not here to consume this word. I'm here to be consumed by this word, to transform by these words into the image and likeness of Christ. And we're meditating in humility. Then the Lord is working in power in our lives. He's teaching us with his own voice how to take these truths and make them our own. Because even though the truth is what it is, we are all so unique that the application of truth in our life can look very different. The way you're called to love can look very different than the way somebody else is called to love. It might both be selfless, it might be giving, but it, for some, it'll be in a classroom. For some people, it'll be at a soup kitchen. For some people, it'll be next to somebody's bed as you're administering the last rites, the anointing of the sick. There's there various forms and expressions of that love, but we all need to meditate upon it and say, okay, God, what are you asking me to do in love today? We all know that we need to surrender our hearts to God, but what you need to surrender before God is not what I need to surrender. We're different. We have different wounds. We have different sins. What's going to be your remedy? Surrender, but there might also be something in particular that God is asking you to do, a particular fast, a particular discipline that you need to do. Your prayer life might look radically different than mine, but we're both in going into communion with Christ because you're wired a certain way and I'm wired a certain way, and there's not a one-all, one-size-fits-all spirituality. That's the beauty of being Catholic. You know, there's so many religious orders. There's so many different ways to pray. We literally have a smorgasbord. If you're a Protestant, they, the, the way they talk about prayer, it's like, okay, you sit down, you quiet yourself, you read some scripture, you say a few prayers, you're done. What? I mean, like, we can meditate. We've got, like, the lives of the saints. We've got prayers. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar, and I want to recommend a book, and I think you might be able to buy it in our bookstore, Divine Intimacy. Have you heard of these, this book? If you have a chance to buy Divine Intimacy, just buy it. It has a daily reflection for every day. And it's so applicable, it's challenging, and what I love it is each daily reflection reflection includes prayers by saints. So they actually go into the prayer journals and prayer writings on prayer that these saints made, and they they put them there, you know, they, they give you something to reflect on, and they give you an example of how a saint prayed into this reflection. You know, and, and, and it challenges you, and it teaches you new ways to pray, new ways to express your heart. You know, they, they, I think one of the things, you know, like you heard a lot of, and, and I'm not, this is not an advocation of any kind of political thing, as I think the church is too political, and I think people are too quick to gravitate and to try to associate being a good Catholic with being a good Republican. 
there once was a time when I think you could have been a very good Catholic and been a very, very good Democrat. Maybe not be the case anymore, but when we hear somebody like Donald Trump speak and everybody's saying, like, I like what he says because it speaks to me. He's saying things that I've been thinking about, but he says it in such a way that I can, you know, that's what it's like when you read the prayers of the saints. Like, they're able to express what's in your heart. It unleashes you to be able to move your will with these words into a deeper sense of conversion, a deeper place of transformation with the Spirit. So divine intimacy, I can't, I can't uh, recommend it enough. It is one of the great tools that I've had to aid, aid myself in the, uh, the work of learning how to meditate. Second is contemplation, right? This is more of a wordless form of prayer. And this is much challenging because it's really the joining of the mind and the heart, the intellect and the affect. Where we focus on God's greatness in loving adoration, we look upon Jesus and the mysteries of his, of, of his life with faith and love and just let the Lord take us on a journey. You know, a lot of contemplation is, uh, can be a, 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 an important part of even getting deeper in Lectio Divina because you can actually let the Spirit take you there. there there's a, uh, one of the greatest things that I think we've lost our sense of is the Christian mind, the Christian imagination. Letting the Spirit lead us to, to where we are really in deep prayer, contemplating these mysteries of God and seeing how our lives relate to them and how, how the Spirit speaks into each one of us in these. But that's a gift of grace. It, contemplation seeks alone Christ himself. You're not trying to understand a teaching. You're trying to encounter Jesus and just contemplate his life. Jesus, what are you saying to me as you speak to the woman at the well? or to blind Bar Bartimaeus. I'm contemplating this moment. What, are you trying, what would you teach me today? As you, as, as you, there's a reason why this story was, was put in Scripture. Believe me, when we take this, this, this time to go deep and let the Spirit lead us, that's when Christ really starts to speak. He'll tell you what His purpose for this Scripture is for you today. Because the beauty of it is, you can come back to that Scripture in six months and God will say you something completely different. Because you're a different person. He's got something else to teach you. Scripture is like a, a diamond. And you move it this way or that way, it's like a, the facets just glitter. Like, oh, I, I never noticed that facet before. Well, because you never really looked at it that angle before. And all of a sudden, you see something shiny and new and beautiful within that Scripture. And Scripture never ceases to amaze when we take time to contemplate it. It's a prayer of silence or silent love. Meditation is kind of a quest. Contemplation is more rest. Just resting with this word and letting God speak. Meditation is mental, cognitive, uh, kind of a discourse that we have with God. Contemplation is more silent, heart-centered, and beholding of the majesty of God and letting that encounter move us to a deeper affection and love for God, a deeper transformation. And as important as meditation is, I would say contemplation is even more so important. Because once again, it takes us to a place where we're letting the Word of God change us, change our hearts. But prayer, you know, I mean, I don't want it to make it sound like it's a serious thing that every time you got to pray, there's got to be a profound encounter with God in that way. Not every prayer you pray is going to be contemplation. Not every prayer and mental prayer that you exercise in is going to be heavy meditation. Sometimes prayer just needs to be communion and friendship with God because He wants to be your friend. He says, look, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. I want friendship with you. And as, you know, he says this as he's about to die. Like this friendship is not going to end with my death. He wouldn't start laying out his idea of wanting to be friends with the apostles right before he dies. I mean, like it's not, it, wasn't, it was for this ongoing relationship it was to be built, built on friendship. And St. Teresa of Jesus, she looked at prayer in this perspective. She said, mental prayer is nothing else than an intimate sharing between friends. It means take time frequently to be alone with them, with him who we know loves us. So we take time frequently. This is what, you know, I mean, like people say to pray always means, oh, if I'm scrubbing the floor, I can offer it up as a prayer. Yes, but if we don't pray at particular times, we're not going to learn how to pray always, you know? And, you know, granted, you might be able to get a good hour in the morning, half hour in the morning, whatever your schedule allows or whatever you're asked to do. But there are so many little moments throughout the day where we can turn our hearts to God and say, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I place my faith and my trust in you. Just we raise our hearts just for a half second and say, Jesus, I acknowledge you're still with me. And even though I'm busy doing this work, I love you and I'm glad you're still on my side. You know, 
like oh Jesus, you know, like laughing with the Lord. You know, when you know something happens, uh, you know, that just it gives you delight. Just like Jesus, thank you for that. You know, thank you for blessing me in that little way. Like little acts of faith, hope, and love, done in faith. I mean, like people say, well, it just seems so rote to you know to say you know Jesus, Son of the Living God, have mercy on my me a sinner. Those even, aren't even my words. Is that really communicating with God? Absolutely, because we're praying it in faith. And those, those acts of faith are what, you remember, Paul wants us to be strengthened that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. And faith demands the continual turning of our hearts to God in big ways and little ways throughout our day. At the center of our prayer, it always rem- it's always the mingling of two hearts, the heart of Jesus and our heart. You know, and, and if the Spirit has a role in it, it's because the Spirit is light that enlightens us how to join it. The Spirit's the glue that joins our souls with Christ, makes us one with Him. So the, the most important piece of advice I can tell you in your relationship with God is be authentic. Please don't go to God thinking you have to impress Him. You know, um, prayer is not performance. It's a real relationship where you can just tell God, dear Lord Jesus, I just want you to know I'm having a shitty day. You can edit that out, Mary Kay. <laughs> Believe it. <laughs> Thank you. But, I mean, like, God would rather hear you say that than say, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I love thee with all my heart. You know, I mean, like, there are times when our form of prayer is very beautiful, but there's times when we just need to be real with God, to be raw and authentic and let him know that we trust him with our worst parts. We don't have to hide it from him. For crying out loud, if we're broken, he's the only solution. Why are we trying to tap dance for the Lord in order to please him? When really the greatest way his glory is going to be revealed in us is if he heals us, forgives us, and transforms us. No, it's a, well, the greatest glory we can give to God is to hide our sin and pretend it's not there and put on the brave face and, you know, no, no. A thousand times no. The saints knew their brokenness. They knew their weaknesses. They knew their utter dependency upon God. And that's why my next point is that prayer is the ultimate expression and experience of humility. There's nothing more prideful to, than you can say as, as a priest, uh, you know, and, or even as a, any Catholic, but especially in your life as a priest. If that's your final destination, you're a priest, and you say to God, I'm too busy to pray, that is the ultimate insult of pride. Because that's your way of saying, like, God, I am so busy doing the great work of building your kingdom. Try to keep up with me. You know, I mean, like, how arrogant. But you see, we, it slips. We lose our discipline. We lose our focus. And then we lose our humility. And then we're lost. Then we're lost. I mean, you look at the priests who've brought, brought, gotten, brought scandal to the church. I can tell you the first thing that they brought was just an arrogance and a disregard to their prayer. We hold this sacred treasure in clay jars. We break, we leak. My goodness, we need prayer more than we need the next breath. You know, there's just no way any of this is going to make sense or be effective for the renewal of the church without prayer at the center of it. Deep, intimate communion with God. Peter, who humiliated himself over and over again, had the ultimate humiliation in denying Christ three times. He taught very quickly, humble yourself therefore under God's mighty right hand that in due time he may exalt you. Like humble yourself. Don't wait <laughs> to, to make a mistake. Don't Learn from my mistakes. Humble yourself because if you don't, God will humble you. And when God humiliates us, because there's no other way to learn, to, to, to learn uh, humility than humiliation. And humiliation can be a public, very embarrassing thing or humiliation can be us renouncing ourselves. And just admitting our nothingness before God and spending time before him in prayer because we know that we're going to get more out of five minutes from God and we're going to be more effective for the building of God in five minutes of prayer than five hours of our best work. That's the ultimate expression of humility. Wisdom chapter 3 verse 1 says the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. When we pray, we put our lives in the hands of God continually as our protection, our guide. And it goes on to say, no, no torment will ever touch them. 
If we're not going to God and placing ourselves, every part of us, in prayer, into the hands of God on a daily basis, we're going to get snatched from the hand of God by Satan. This is wisdom and protection and love that Christ gives us that we discover when we submit ourselves and give all ourselves to God in prayer. Even when we're in a time of dryness and we're experiencing this inability to pray, even more so in those moments, the humiliation of knowing that even prayer is beyond us, we continue to say, God, be merciful to me. Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but I'm going to stay here, Lord, because you've called me to be with you. I know that I cannot get there on my own. Help me, Jesus. The best thing that I did uh, in the last year when I was hitting hard spots in prayer was just I just kind of reoriented my prayer to say, before I start going to God with what I think I want in my agenda, I'm just going to stop and just say, Holy Spirit, I am here. Lead me to where I need to be in prayer right now. Jesus is out there. And at one time I was praying this, I had this really clear vision of, of, of me standing at a door and behind the door was Jesus. And it was me trying to pray. And I was like banging on the door and the door wasn't open. I was kicking the door. I was frustrated, banging with both hands, kicking this door like, God, why can't I knock this door down? I want to be with you. And all of a sudden there was a tap on my shoulder and it was the spirit. He said, come here, I want to show you something. He led me around the corner of this building. There was like the small little door kind of hidden away. And he opened it up. He says, enter in. And, he's, and it was just like the Lord confirming that he's going to lead me to how I need to go and enter into God's presence, to really commune with God. The Spirit will lead us there. So just surrendering. Because if we call the Holy Spirit the interior master of prayer, then we've got to give him authority. We have to be subject to his leading us in prayer. We can't be running ahead of the Spirit saying, okay, I'm going to go find Jesus. He's like, I know exactly where he is. Do you want me to show you? No, I'll figure it out. Because anyway, we'll always get frustrated with that attitude, right? I'll figure it out. I can do this. I, me, I got this. You're like, no, we don't even have prayer. It's the ultimate expression and experience of humility to pray well. We will come to experience in pray, prayer if we're doing it right. At some point or another, the truth of our own nothingness before God. You put yourself before God long enough, you're going to discover that you're nothing before him. And in that, you'll find complete freedom. Nothing depends on you. It all is about God and what he wants to do in you and through you. St. Teresa of Jesus taught, the whole groundwork of prayer is based on humility. The more a soul lowers itself in prayer, the more God will raise it up. What a beautiful thing to remember, that we don't have to raise ourselves up and justify ourselves before God. We just need to make ourselves small, to make ourselves low and say, God, it is me. I'm a sinner. I want to be with you. I need your love today. I don't know how to pray. Spirit, guide me. I also call upon the Blessed Mother a lot. Mother Mary, you know and love Jesus. Lead me to his heart. Through your immaculate heart, help me to find the sacred heart in prayer. Because Mary is, is kind of like God's like SWAT team. First responder goes in and finds those who are really hopeless and, and lost and helps them out. She's been so evident in my prayer. Like you know, People say, like, how do you know the Holy Spirit? What's, how do you pray in the Spirit? I'm like, the most spirit-filled prayer, prayers I have anymore are when I'm praying my rosary. It, honestly, because she's the spouse of the Spirit. And I always pray right before I, the, 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 uh, when I pray my rosary. It's like, this is meditation on the life of Christ. Holy Spirit, guide my praying of the rosary. Let me not just rattle off Hail Marys and Our Fathers, but take me into the mystery. We pray this at the end of the rosary, that meditating upon these mysteries of the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we might imitate what they contain, and obtain what they promise. That's the whole goal of, of praying the rosary, not to check off the box, pray my rosary today, cha-ching. It's to imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise. So this prayer, you know, the, the, the prayer of, of the rosary can also be a great tool to aid in our meditation and even contemplation. Because once again, I started my rosary and I started contemplating uh, Christ coming into the world as a baby. I went down this rabbit hole of just imagining and, and praying and being awed by God. I didn't even get through the first decade. Yeah, well, you mission accomplished. You did what the rosary was supposed to do. It took you into the mystery of Jesus. But I, no, it's not an accomplishment. It's a pathway. Uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen said it's the book of the blind. 
the rosary. It's, and it is kind of like reading Braille because you're feeling the beads and praying and meditating and God is speaking and he's teaching. It's very beautiful. But finally, prayer is love. Because God is love. And the, and the focus and the encounter of our, our prayer is God. In 1 John chapter 4, it says God is love. Prayer is love. It's our ability to enter into the heart of Jesus, to experience the love of the Father, to, 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 to experience the love of the Spirit that proceeds from the Father and the Son, who wants to you know, set us on fire with divine love. You want to love God? Let the love of the Holy Spirit fill you. Because if it's just your human emotion leading you, that's going to fail. I mean, we, I believe in human love. People say, oh, there's no love apart from God. No, humans can love. We can desire the good of another person. We can seek to, to, to be good people without the Holy Spirit. But we're going to fall incredibly short. I mean, we might be able to do things that look good, things that might be kind on, on some level. But we won't be pleasing unto God because we're doing it apart from Him. When we have the prayer, our prayer in place and the Spirit is moving in our lives, everything that we do is not only for the glory of God, it's joined with the glory of God. It reflects the glory of God. It's, it's geared towards giving God glory. Why do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Because it gives God glory. When we obey the commands, we give God glory. Well, don't our neighbors have dignity and just deserve love because they're our neighbors? Absolutely, but by adhering to that truth, we give God glory. And the reason why sin is so repugnant to us is because it robs God of his glory. St. Irenaeus said, the glory of God is man fully alive. Man fully alive is a man pursuing holiness and the love of God, not pursuing the world in selfish gain. St. John of the Cross says, be joyful and gladdened in your interior recollection with him for you have him so close to you. Desire him there. Adore him there. He's talking about in the, in the self. He goes, do not go in pursuit of him outside yourself. You will only become distracted and wearied thereby, and you shall not find him, nor have him more intimately than by seeking him within you. You know, we, we, we love to stand before a, a beautiful altar that's been restored to its former glory. You know, like sometimes you see these churches that got stripped of all their finery and the statues and the altar was torn down. It's like, oh, this makes you want to throw up. And then, then you see one that's been restored. And it just, it just takes your breath away. A beautifully restored church when there's stars on the ceiling, everything, they went full tilt. And it just takes your breath away. And as much as that inspires us to awe and wonder, the place where we encounter Jesus the deepest is not out there, but in here, when we quiet ourselves through interior prayer. Once again, from St. Teresa, she says, Do you think it matters little for a soul with a wandering mind to understand this truth and see that there is no need to go to heaven in order to speak with one's heavenly Father or find delight in Him? Nor is there any need to shout, however softly we speak, He is near enough to hear us. Neither is there any need for wings to go find him. All one need do is go into solitude and look at him within oneself. This is why Jesus was very clear, like the kingdom of heaven is within you. We want to build the external kingdom. We want to restore the city of God. We want to help restore Christendom. Let that happen within first. Let God build the interior castle. Your prayer life, make it tall and strong. Let your roots go very deep into Jesus. Because if you're not rooted deeply in Jesus, when the winds of hatred and, and, and rejection and sometimes loneliness and sometimes you're going to be tempted to despair and people are going to mock you and reject you and look at you with suspicion because you wear a collar, you're automatically going to be branded a pedophile or a creep because you stood wearing your clerics in public, and for many people that's become synonymous with being a bad person, the church is the last bastion of truth that stands up for what is right. And if, we're, and if our roots are not deep in Christ, you will get blown over. It's the trees that have the deepest roots. When you see a tree that has grown up to this beautiful thing and it's, it's got shade and, the, and there's animals finding shade and comfort, 
and it's producing fruit, and the fruit is falling onto the ground, and people are eating of this fruit, and, and people are be, life is being sustained by this tree. What you don't see is, is the greatest part of the tree, stretching out for hundreds of feet in every direction under the soil and going down deep into the soil are roots. You kill the roots, you kill the tree. I have forsythia growing in the backyard. Does anyone ever have forsythia growing in their yard? You can't kill that. You can't, you, I chopped it all down, like one whole bush. Like my wife's like, let's get rid of the forsythia. So I chopped it all down to like it was just nubs. Within three weeks, it was three feet high again. It just grows because I didn't dig up the roots. I also had a silver maple. I love silver maples because when in the summertime when the wind is blowing, they, they have green on one side and silver on the other. They shimmer. And I love this tree, and its roots started to die. And I noticed, you know, the top branches went dead, and then the lower branches went dead. And finally, the branches that were closest to the ground were still alive, but everything above it was dead because the roots weren't able to absorb enough nutrients to keep the whole thing alive. I eventually had to call a tree service in to cut it down because it was so close to my house that had it fallen, it would have fallen into my house. And I was so sad to see that silver maple go. But if we have deep roots, I can't kill you. If your roots are dead, you're not going to you're not going to thrive. You're not going to make it. Which you know leads me to my next point that prayer needs to be looked at as the number one thing that you'll do battle for in your life. You know, we want to fight for the unborn. We want to fight even for a just society, and I mean like justice for everybody. I mean, I, there, there's a lot of lifestyles that we cannot condone as Catholics, but we would never condone anyone being robbed of their dignity, no matter what their orientation or skin color is. Like, you know, like all the isms that are out there, I shared this at Life in the Spirit, the, the one ism that we need to be focused on to unite and heal the world is baptism. It is the one ism that actually has hope for us is the grace of our baptism. But more important than any social justice issue that you're going to do battle for, or any human rights issue that you're going to do battle for, or even spiritual battle for the soul of another is your own battle for prayer. Because if you're not girded up, if you're not wearing the breastplate of righteousness, if you don't have the helmet of salvation on, if you're not prepared and you're not fighting for your prayer, you're not going to be any good to God. Why? Because God is a jealous God. He does not let his glory be revealed in those who are not one with him. He will not lead you. You know, if you want to pursue holiness without Jesus, go ahead, but you'll never find it. Holiness is Jesus alive in us, his spirit alive in us. And we can try to pursue it and try to make ourselves holy, or we can surrender to Jesus and his power, and he will make us holy. And we will collaborate with the grace necessary. But that happens through prayer. The Catechism says in Article 2725, it says, Prayer is both a gift of grace and a determined response on our part. There's a, there's a real danger, and I even see it here on our campus, it's quietism. You know, like, oh, I'll just, I'll just wait for God to show up and do something. Ah. You know, and you've probably been taught this enough through your discernment process that you don't sit back and God comes and gives you a little slip of paper, this is my plan. You take a step. Is the peace still there? then take the next step. Is the peace still there? Is there a confirmation that you're still on the path? We have to, in our own prayer, have the determined response to the grace of Jesus Christ because it is a gift of grace to be able to pray. Even the desire to pray is a gift of grace, but we need to respond to it. It goes on to say, it always presupposes effort. There are no lazy saints. You know, saints worked hard to become saints. He goes on to say, the great figures of prayer in the Old Covenant before Christ, as well as the Mother of God, the saints, and Christ himself all teach us this. Prayer is a battle. Against whom? Against ourselves. And against the wiles of the tempter, who does all he can to turn man away from prayer, away from union with God. Wow. Because Satan knows as soon as you're cut off, separated from Jesus, you're like a branch that's been cut from the tree. Suitable for what? To wither and die and be thrown into the fire. But Jesus himself talked about this. You know, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. Nine times he says those words in the 15th chapter of John's gospel. Abide in me. Like he was just telling you guys, I can't say this enough. If you're not abiding in me, 
I can't work in you and through you, and you will do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have this thing like, here's the things I know I can do apart from God. I can put on my socks in the morning. God doesn't care if I wear blue or brown or black, right? I can have Captain Crunch or Nestle's Crunch, whatever. I, like, I do crunches in the morning. You know, that's how I exercise. It's either Captain Crunch or Nestle Crunch. But, you know, like, we can decide what we want to do and what we want to eat. We have so much control over the little choices that don't matter. But the big things that really do matter, we have the same amount of freedom with, but unless we submit that freedom and make that choice to habitually submit ourselves to God in prayer, we'll be pulled away from them. That passage, 27, 25, it says, the spiritual battle of the Christian's new life is inseparable from the battle of prayer. You will never have a time in your life when your prayer is not going to be a battle for you. You'll either be battling your own laziness or you're battling Satan who's trying to pull you from prayer or just battling all the distractions he throws in your way. It'll be a battle until the day you die. It is the one, number one way that spiritual battle will be manifested in your life. And if you surrender your prayer, you give up that prayer, you've lost everything. I can't say this enough. I, 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 and I don't think I'm exaggerating in the least bit. I had the, the, the sadness of being a youth minister at a parish in North Carolina where the priest left the priesthood to go live with his gay lover. He stopped praying, stopped activating his, the grace of his baptism, stopped cooperating with grace, gave up on himself, gave up on God, and chose a lifestyle contrary to the gospel. And at the last homily at, he ever delivered at our parish, he actually announced it to everybody. I want you to know I've discerned what's best for me. I'm leaving the priesthood. I have a, a, a homosexual lover down in Charlotte who's living in North Carolina. I'm going to go live with him. I might stay in the area. So if you're hiring or you know somebody who's hiring, I need a job next week. He actually said this in his last homily. I'm like, I'm like, are you serious right now? I love the man. He was good to me. He was a good boss. And I think he definitely loved the people that he served, but he did not have the life of the Spirit activated in him. He was not rooted in Christ. He was rooted in self-love and despair and whatever wounds led him to that. God have mercy on his soul. But I had to pick up the pieces with the young people and try to explain to them why God was still sitting on the throne of their parish. You know, like it was going to be all right. It was crazy. But this is what happens when we lose our prayer. We lose our theological and mental and spiritual sanity. Anything can happen. Under the umbrella of Christ in prayer, we are guarded against all attacks. Step out from underneath that umbrella, you're going to get hit by every storm Satan throws at you. St. Maximilian Colby, St. Padre Pio, even I think St. Thomas Aquinas, they all describe Satan as a chain dog, right? You ever hear this? He's a dog on a chain, which means unless you go within his range, within his circle of influence, you're protected. Satan just cannot walk up to somebody, jump into their soul, overtake them, and wrestle them to the ground and possess them. That is not the ability that Satan has for somebody who's in Christ. And even somebody who's not in Christ, it's like they really have to cooperate and collaborate for Satan to really dominate and, and infest their life. But when we don't pray, right, we're moving into Satan's circle. Prayer, is, you know, he's on a leash. Our leash is this chain of hope that anchors us to Jesus, that keeps us out of Satan's reach. And he'll bark at you. He will snarl at you. He will try to tempt you and scare you and intimidate you. But he is a chained dog. And God willing, you'll become as holy as Padre Pio someday so that Satan can pick you up and throw you across the room as he spiritually attacks you. And you'll wake up in the morning bruised and bloodied because Satan attacked you all night. But you'll still be as holy as everybody, uh, holier than anybody because you'll have survived and persevered. Actually, I don't wish that on anybody, but I think that'd be kind of a cool experience to be lifted out of your bed and thrown across the room by Satan, but in the end have him watch him walk away like a, like a wounded puppy. Because for all of his antics and all of his theatrics, he knew he's, he's a defeated, chained dog with his tail hanging between his legs. You know, and, and, and we need, but we need to do this battle in our prayer. You know, the, the tools that Satan will use to divide you from him is number one, division, right? Division. I talked about this this morning, this disruption. When, when, when Satan, when, when enemies go into battle, the first thing you want to do is disrupt communications. If you can confuse your enemy and disrupt communication with headquarters, the people will scatter. They won't be unified. We won't be unified in ourselves. We'll be in an emotional basket case or intellectually lost in a thought or spiritually feeling discouraged, whatever. If we're divided and disrupted in our prayer, 
God can't take all the forces of our will, our intellect, and our emotions and line them up so that we can go into the battle strong with a united front to overcome Satan through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that prayer helps us to align all the assets that we have within ourselves and gear them towards doing the Lord's holy will. But he'll try to disrupt that. He'll try to make you believe that there's something that's coming across your plate right now that's more important to prayer. Now, the average American right now watches between six and eight hours of of television, surfing the Internet, some sort of media. Think about that. Six to eight hours a day, that's 25% of your life. That means by the time you're 40, you'll have spent 10 years of your life watching television or surfing the Internet. If you're way below average and you're, I only surf the Internet maybe two hours, I watch television two hours a day, that's still... 10% of your life. That means that 10 years from now, you'll have spent a whole year of uninterrupted time in your life watching television or surfing the internet. But between video games, so many young men, so many young women, they're spending a third to a fourth of their life tied to a, a device that promises them nothing but a distraction, this ongoing distraction, distraction. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants us to focus on anything but God. He'll use anything to distract us. And usually we get so distracted even before we go to prayer, right? We consume so much media and so many news flashes and news sound bites and this that when we finally sit down to be quiet, we're trying to process everything we just consumed for the last 24 hours. And our hearts can't and our minds can't be still. We need to stop the distractions of prayer before we go to prayer. It's a radical thing to say. I mean, I have been working on this very diligently in my life. I have an iPad that I use for work. I have deleted all media apps off that uh, device. It is now simply a work device because it used to be so easy wherever I was and I could get on the internet. And even if I wasn't near Wi-Fi, I could you know, use my phone as a hotspot and watch uh, something on Netflix. I canceled Netflix. Uh, you know, I mean, like, I just, okay, I, I'm wasting my life. I'm 56 years old and, I, and, I, and I'm estimating I have maybe 20 to 25 more years of, of good ministry that God's going to call me to. And I don't want to look back and say, oh, well, I, and when I knew I had 25 years ago left, I still chose to spend two or three of those watching TV. <laughs> You're not going to wake up on your deathbed saying, oh, Lord Jesus, can, I, can, I, can you keep me alive for one more week? The, ne- the next season of, of, of The Office is dropping or, you know, <laughs> name it. Or, oh, it's about to become baseball season. Just let me live through baseball season. Then take me, Lord. That's not what's going to be on your mind as you go to meet your maker. In fact, I think a lot of us, when we stand before the Lord, he rolls the tape and we see hour after hour after hour after day after week after month after year of us sitting on our butts looking at a screen. We're going to have, have nothing but shame and misery saying, Lord, I could have done so much more. You ever, ever see the movie Schindler's List? At the end when he's looking at this list of people he saved, he's like, I could have, this could have, I could have sold this and, you know, one more. What's that? Yeah, all he had was this, I saved so many, but I could have saved more. And, and we don't want to be that way with God. I could have done so much more, but I, I didn't. So what do we do? How do we overcome the, the vision? He'll try to make you feel like a discouraged person. He'll say things to you like, if you, if you pray and you don't feel anything, you're a hypocrite. You're not, you don't have active faith because you're not feeling anything. You're not in the right state of heart. You know that Mother, St. Mother Teresa lived the last 30 years of her life in desolation with no real sense of God's presence in her life when she prayed? And you know that she still prayed two hours every day? And she had all of her nuns pray for two hours a day because she said, if I can't see Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, I won't see Jesus in the poor. That was her spiritual food. And even though she wasn't consoled by those minutes, she was empowered by those minutes to do the Lord's holy will in her life. You know, you might even begin to think, I'm not worthy to feel God in my prayer. I'm so broken and I'm so sinful. I don't deserve to feel God. And the Lord does want to get, we, there are times when God wants to console you. He does love you so much. We hold back because we don't feel like we're worthy of having a deep prayer life. I'm, you know, we feel like St. Peter, Lord, go away, I'm a sinful man. And the Lord's like, yeah, I know, that's why I'm here. I'm the only solution for that sin that you were, you're so worried about. I'm your only hope. Don't push me away now. Because once you realize you're a sinful man, you're halfway there to say, I'm a forgiven man. You know? 
<laughs> Most people don't realize they need Jesus. If you realize you need Jesus, you're almost there. So I'm at 4 o'clock. Um, do you mind if I take five more minutes? All right, I'll be quick. I promise it's only going to be five because I just want to kind of touch over the dynamics of prayer. First, entering a prayer. I already talked about but but trusting in the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says in the Catechism 2672. It says, The Holy Spirit, whose anointing permeates our whole being, is the interior master of Christian prayer. He is the artisan of the living tradition of prayer. I love artisan things, like artisan food, handcrafted, quality ingredients, good stuff. I don't, I don't want to, uh, to eat a, 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 at a fast food restaurant. I mean, when I get to travel and I'm at a place and the priest says, oh, you know, uh, you know, let's go out and get a burger tonight. Like, where do you want to go? I'm like, anywhere but a chain. You know, don't take me to Applebee's. We have Applebee's in Steubenville. It's, it's one level above dog food in most cases, right? Most things at Applebee's are is microwaved or fried. I said, where do locals go to get the really good stuff? Well, you know, who's got the best burger in town? Who crafts their burgers? You know, I went to this one place when I was in Waynesville, North Carolina, this small uh, city up in the mountains, and it was just like fantastic, handcrafted artisan burger. And that's how the Holy Spirit is. He uses the best ingredients and handcrafts each one of us, custom made, not mass produced. He's an artisan. He's the artisan of the living tradition of prayer, which means this living tradition, this river of grace that flows through the church that's called prayer, he invites us all into, but he forms us in a particular way, individually, into a masterpiece of our own. He goes on to say, to be sure there are as many paths of prayer as there are persons who pray, but it is the same Spirit acting in all and with all. It is the, in the communion of the Holy Spirit that Christian prayer is prayer in the church. So when, remember, when we say our Father, we're not just admitting that, you know, or, or understanding when we say our Father that, oh, that unites us to Christ. We share a common fatherhood with Christ. It also means that we are one. That I'm not just praying for myself, I'm praying for all of you, like our Father, Together, one human body. When I lift up my prayers to God, I have to be lifting up everyone. Not just, you know, because like we can have personal intimacy with Jesus, but there's a, an expression our Protestant brothers use, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Do you all have a personal relationship with Jesus? I would say no. I have personal intimacy with Jesus. God speaks to me in a very personal way, but as soon as I came into a relationship with Jesus, you became my brothers. You became my sisters. You know, like, like, we became a family. So it's no longer just a personal thing. It's just not me and Jesus. As long as I got me and Jesus, I'm okay. I pray our Father, I make a vow to you to love you, to serve you, to honor you, and to help bring you to heaven. Our Father has words beyond, oh, God is my Father. That's so cool. It means like every human person becomes, you're, you're, you're related to them in a way that you, you owe them love and dignity. It calls us out of ourselves to pray the Our Father. And that's when we have the Holy Spirit active that that prayer becomes prayer in the church, uniting us all. St. Bonaventure said, simply put, the Holy Spirit comes when he, where he's loved, where he is invited, and where he is expected. And so we have to, when we come to pray, just pray, Holy Spirit, don't lead me to a feeling, don't lead me to emotion, lead me to the heart of Jesus, and let me abide there during this time. And how do we do that? Acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. That same rhythm that we have in conversation with one another. To acknowledge is to give an authentic giving of yourself as you are right now to Jesus. To say, I'm having a bad day, Lord. Or, Lord, today I woke up just feeling overwhelmed by this in my life. Or feeling troubled by this in my life. I just want to tell you, this is how, where I'm at, Lord. And then relate it to God. But God, I know that this anxiety is not of you that you are my anchor in the storm. And so I come to you, Jesus, and say, be my anchor. You know, you say, Jesus, you're the one. This is where our meditation and our, our knowledge of Scripture helps. You, Lord, you said, uh, come unto me, all you who are weary. I feel weary today. I'm coming unto you, Lord. I want to find the rest for my soul. You relate it back to him. If you're feeling joy, like, God, I'm just so excited that I've been called to the priesthood. I'm just, I feel so blessed. Lord Jesus, you're the giver of all joy. I'm fighting this joy because you're in this call. You're the center of this call, and I'm so grateful for that. Right now, in this joy, I turn it back to you, God, the source of all joy. Whatever you're dealing with, just take it and relate it. Acknowledge where you're at and relate it to Jesus. Well, however that is, good, bad, ugly, it's all good because it's real. And then just receive. 
the Holy Spirit will speak to us. It might be, it might take a while for you just to, you know, find that place of peace. And this is why the listening part of our prayer needs to be expanded. The talking part needs to be cut back. But you can be t- sure the Spirit is speaking when you feel like you're not being rushed. If you have like this voice saying, you got to get this done. This is what I want you to do. Do it now. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. He brings peace and clarity, not panic and rush to, rush to action. Like so many people are, you know, like I'm all in for God. And therefore, when this, you know, I let myself be, be deceived that the first thing the Spirit wants to say, tell me is go do something. You know, the, the first the Spirit says he wants us to be something. Then we can go do something. Just like Jesus said, I want you to go make disciples of all nations. But first, I want you to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Just wait. So that's what we need to do in prayer. We need to wait for the Holy Spirit to guide us. The Holy Spirit speaks in a soft inner voice. He doesn't bark. He doesn't coerce. He wants our cooperation, our collaboration. Most importantly, the Holy Spirit wants us to do it out of love. So he's going to woo us with love. He's not going to use fear tactics. He's not going to scare us into coercion. So if you have an accusing voice, a voice in your head, reject it in the name of Jesus because that's not the Spirit speaking. We know who the great accuser is. It's Satan who wants to take your eyes off of Jesus and put them back on yourself. You're not good enough. You need to do this. Why aren't you doing this? You're never going to be good enough. All these things that sometimes fly into our head when we pray. Just, and how do we do that? We renounce them in the name of Jesus. I renounce you. Go away, Satan. You have no power here. I'm with Jesus. Holy Spirit, so quiet my heart. The Holy Spirit will inspire you. He will not intimidate you. He will invite you. It is Satan that puts the fear and forcing in our lives. Like, oh, I've got to do this or I'm just never going to please the Lord. That's not the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit invites you to give your heart once again to Jesus. The Holy Spirit invites you to listen and ponder like he did with the Blessed Mother. Not push you to an, you know, unthought of decision. Like, you know, like, take the time to think things through. There's wisdom that will be revealed. Nine times out of ten, we rush our decisions because we feel compelled to make decisions, to be men of action and decision. And what the Spirit is saying, like, I need men who are prayerful and receptive and being led. But finally, there is that part where we do need to respond. So if you're taking your time and the Lord says, okay, this is what I want you to do, and he lays it all out, you have to be willing to do it. I think people say, well, God's not speaking to me. Like, well, how committed to you are you to obedience? What do you mean? Well, if the Lord asked you to go and forgive somebody, would you go do it? No, I couldn't forgive that person. Well, that's why the Lord's not speaking to you, because you're not willing to do what he'll tell you to do. You've got to come with a blank page and say, Jesus, I'm not giving you, like, you know, what, what do they call those little things uh, where they give you, like, a, put in a, the name of a color. The man walked in wearing a blank jacket, and then, you know, like, what are they called? Mad Libs, thank you. We don't come to God with the Mad Libs. With most of the story written, just add God, add God. You just put a few words in there that I need to know. We come with a blank page. We don't have the story you already created and ask God to just fill in details. We come with a blank page and say, what is your will for me? Now, within your state of light, life, right, a lot of those decisions are made for you, and that's good. You know, my morning prayer. I don't have to decide today if I'm going to have a morning prayer. Or I'm going to do communal prayer. I know that those things are worked into my schedule because that's what I do. Like for me, I don't know. I don't have to wonder whether or not God wants me to talk to my kids. <laughs> you know, they need me. That's, that, that's what a father does. But I need to be able to respond when the Lord says, go in a particular direction. We have to be willing to, to obey, to respond. And if you're doing that on a regular basis with your concerns, with your heart, just giving it, the Lord will, will, will help you to grow into, into a prayer warrior. You'll wake up hungry for God. Your first thought before your feet hit the floor is, Jesus Christ, I make you the Lord of my life. Take this day and make it unto you. I give my life to you now. I want to be with you now because I know at some point during the day, I'm going to really want to be with you and I'm going to need you. But if I neglect you now, what if I can't find you when I really need you? You know, and the truth is we need God all the time. But I'm saying like, We need to really make that room to commune with God when we can. Because the ultimate end of our life is not ministry. The ultimate end of our existence is communion with God in heaven. With nothing to do but be with him. To sing his praise for all of eternity. No more problems to solve. No more fires to put out. No more important decisions to be made or not made. Just communion. No more baptisms, no more confessions to hear. Just 
eternal bliss. And everything that we love about life will be a part of heaven. The best parts of what we have here on earth without all the garbage. <laughs> if I told you, 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 you know, it would, if I said to you, it, I'll make a deal. If you give every waking moment of your life from here on out to Jesus Christ and forsake everything else, I promise you if you do that, you'll go to heaven. Would you make that deal? Who wouldn't, right? Uh, our life on earth is like a drop in the bucket compared to like the ocean of eternity, right? We'll be swimming in that water forever and still not hit the bottom. Um, and I would say, well, what would it take for you to give, uh, how, about, how about 5% of your day to God? Well, what's 5% of my day? One hour. Give one hour of, to God in mental prayer. That's 5% of your day. And give another 5% to spiritual reading. Because if you invest that time, you'll become a saint. And you'll be on the path to sainthood. And we, 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 need to pe- we need to keep things in perspective, right? Nothing is more important than communion with Christ. And, and don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. So let's stop here. Let's pray, because I went way over the five minutes that you gave me. I'm a greedy little person, and I apologize. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you love us so much, that you accept us where we are at, as we are. But we also praise you, Jesus, that you love us so much that you refuse to let us remain as we are, that you're constantly calling us to change, to grow, to become everything that you made us to be. Spirit, be poured out on our lives in abundance. Let this fire of God transform us, because just as fire transforms everything it touches, may the fire of God's love the passion for the Father, the passion for prayer, be awakened in our souls, drawing us deeper into the mystery of Christ and his love. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have not made prayer a priority, for the times that we've wasted our lives. And Lord, you're more than, more than able to forgive and mercifully uh, you know, cast our sin from us. And with that, we just want to recommit ourselves right now, Lord, to our prayer, to you as our Lord and Savior, to you, Holy Spirit, as the interior master who will guide us and form prayer in our hearts. We surrender all of this to you, Jesus, knowing that you are more than capable of of doing more than we could ever ask or imagine through trusting in your power and your love. Just be with us now, Lord. Continue to be with us through the rest of this retreat. And we ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.